Good evening. Good evening. God bless you. Amen. So good to see you all. God bless you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hey, Lauren, how are you? It's good to see you. God bless you. God bless you, Julia. Amen. So good to see you all this evening. <coughs> Excuse me. God bless you, Lisa. Mother Angela, God bless you. God bless you, Wendy. God bless you. Good to see you all. Thank you for joining with me this evening. Amen. So good to see you guys. God bless you, Crystal. Good evening. Amen. Thank you for joining with me. Listen, if you have not done so already, can you please share it on your page so that others will know that we are on? Amen. And we can begin as quickly as possible. Amen. And so, so good to see you all. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Christina, God bless you. God bless you. It's good to see you. Amen. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. God bless. God bless. So good to see you guys. So good to see you. God bless you, Jeannie. God bless you. Thank you for, for stopping in tonight. Amen. So good to see you all. Amen. We're going to begin shortly. If you have not done so already, can you please share this on your page so that others will know that we're on? So that way everyone can come in in a timely fashion. Thank you so much for joining with me tonight and for taking out time out of your schedule to spend a few moments with me. God bless you. God bless you, Apostle Strahd. It's so good to see you. Peace be unto you, my sister. We got to catch up real soon. <laughs> uh, so good to see you all. God bless you, Sister Edna. God bless you. Amen. Amen. So listen, we're going to be getting ready to begin. Thank you for taking our time out of your schedule to join with me this evening. I thank God for this privilege. Um, all right, I see you, Jeannie. I, I got you. God bless you, Bridget. Amen. And so listen, we want to get right into the word of God. Amen. And so let's begin in prayer. Amen. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you thanking you, Lord, for this blessed privilege that we have, Lord God, to study your word for your word is truth. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. And so, God, we thank you for everyone who thought it not robbery to join with us tonight. God, we pray in Jesus' name that, Lord God, you would fulfill our every desire, that, Lord God, you would strengthen our hearts and renew our minds and bless us, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that, Father, that we might experience, Lord God, the greatness of who you are. Father, we thank you for every person that is on this line tonight and for those who will be watching hereafter. God, I pray that your peace would rest upon us and that, God, you would give us the strength that we stand in need of tonight. Holy Spirit, grant unto me free flow that your word might proceed forth with power and authority. And God, I thank you, Lord God, remove from us anything that would hinder us from hearing your voice. We thank you right now. It's in the matchless and mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. All right. So. Listen, we're going to get right into this, right into this. And y'all, please forgive me. I've been rushing all over today and my body temperature is, is rising in this place because I really want to be outside in the wind. But I am grateful for this privilege of, of coming before you this evening. I pray that God would give you health and strength and that you guys would be in perfect health right now. I thank God that God has protected me and, and others and those of you watching, God has been watching over us. And so we, we trust him for everything, right? We listen to the word of God. We listen to the voice of God so that God could tell us what things we ought to do and what things we ought not to do. 
The scripture says, by your word are your servants warned, right? And so it's important to know that when we hear the voice of God, it's not for naught. When we hear the voice of God, it's so that we might be led, so that we might be protected, so that we might be shielded from the things that are happening in this world. And then if God so wills that we are to go through something, then guess what? We don't go through alone, but we go through with the power of God resting upon us. And so tonight, I want to share with you, as you saw the title, tonight's title is uh, the second part of what we started last night. And last night we we talked about, you know, that you have to rise from the ashes, right? You got to get up from that old stuff, right? And so last night we started like a precursor, almost like a summary form of some of the things we're going to be talking about. We talked about what you got to do at the in the night season and what you got to do for versus midnight and versus before the breaking of day, right? And we talked about that last night. And so I pray if you didn't see last night's teaching, I would encourage you to go back and to watch last night's teaching because then it'll make sense because we're building upon a foundation, right? And that foundation is Christ. And we're building and we're constructing and we're building levels after levels after levels, right? So tonight, part two is about loose them. Loose them, right? It's important to know this. This is very important. I pray that tonight that you guys would really listen tonight and and take this to heart and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to your hearts tonight, right? Um, Firstly, I do not stand in judgment of anyone. But what I do, what I am doing is allowing God to speak and I'm listening and then I'm telling you exactly what the Lord says, right? So when you follow the Lord's will, when you follow the Lord's word, then you're going to find the results of what God has promised, right? One person said it this way, God's will done God's way never lacks God's provision. So it's important for us as people to now do the things that God has commanded us. It is important for us to live in the way that God would want us to live, right? So turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And we're going to get right into this. Um, We're going to skip around chapter 11, but in the essence of time, um, so that we can kind of get through this portion, right? So I want you to look at John chapter 11. Um, And when you get to John chapter 11, right, um, you know this story, very familiar passage of scripture, a scripture where Lazarus, uh, one of uh, Jesus's friends, close one to his heart, Lazarus was sick and eventually died. Right. Um, And now let's go down when we get to um, verse 17. We're going to start at verse 17. Right. And like I said, I'm going to skip around. Right. So I just need you to follow along with me. So in John chapter 11, verse 17, look at what it says. It says, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Right. Um, Now, let's skip to the end. Let's skip to the end, right? The end, if you look at verse 44, it says, And he who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Amen. So now listen, we understand the truth of this scripture. The truth of this scripture is, in its simplicity, right? One of Jesus' friends got sick, died, right? He got sick. He died. In the essence of time between his sickness and his death, Jesus was told that he was sick and Jesus waited a few more days. He waited, right? He didn't do anything right away. He waited. And then what happened? Lazarus eventually died. When Lazarus died, here comes Jesus. Jesus come into town, right? After the fact, he come into town. After the fact, this is key to understand. He come into town after the fact. And when he comes, Martha said, if you would have been here, right? He would not have died, right? And you find that in verse 21, 
Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you have been here, my brother would not have died. But then she goes, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus says to her, verse 23, your brother will rise again. Mary said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day, right? Look at Jesus' response, verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? This is important. This is so important, people of God, for what we're going to share with you tonight. This is so, so important because in order for you to rise from the ashes, and what does the ashes represent? The ashes represents that part of your life that got burned away, that part of your life that was destroyed, that part of your life that was deceived, that part of your life that was broken, that part of your life that was wounded, right? Those, those areas of your life, each of us, every single one of us watching tonight, every single one of us have gone through we have gone through problems. We've gone through difficulties. We've gone through heartache and heartbreak. Some of you watching tonight have gone through divorce. Some of you have gone through losing of a child or losing of a loved one, a spouse. Some of you are widowed. widowed. Um, other, others of you have experienced where folks have deceived you, where folks have cheated you. Um, you've experienced so much heartache and just heartbreak, right? And what is important, it is so important for you to lose that situation, to loose it and to let it go. It is so important for you to loose it because if you don't, then you will not understand the power that is available from God for you, for that you can live. Now, in the natural part of this scripture, we find that here it was a brother of two sisters, the friend of Jesus died. When he died, right, um, the sisters were mourning. And what happens is that the sisters were surrounded around people who were mourning with them, people who were standing in an agreement with them that what you are going through and what you are experiencing is sadness, right? Listen. <clears throat> One of the things that I've done in my life is throughout my lifetime, whenever I've been through difficult times in my life, I didn't find, I wouldn't look for anyone who would agree with my difficulty, but I look for somebody who would give me a different frame of mind. Not somebody who will pet me on the shoulder or rub me on the back, but I look for someone that will have cognizant of mine, presence of mine to tell me even if I'm wrong, to tell me even if there's a way for me to change what I'm doing. Too often, we're looking for the comfortable. Too often, we're looking for the people who agree. Let's be honest. Most of our friends that we surround ourselves with are people that we get along with, are people that it's an easier time. Come on, in our humanity, it is hard for us to hang with somebody who don't necessarily agree with us. It is hard for us to hang with people or to stay around people who, you know, are argumentative or people uh, that are, you know, people who don't go along with our program. In fact, many of us pastors and leaders, what do we select? We select people around us that oftentimes agree with us, right? And that agree with our program and that agree with our agenda because it's quite difficult to deal with difficult people. It is quite difficult to handle people who don't really agree with us. But I want to share with you today that for some of us, for all of us, we need some of those people in our lives. We need the people who are going to call a duck a duck. We need a people that's going to tell us we are wrong even when we are falling out and crying. We need somebody who's going to stand in our presence and tell us the difficult things that we don't want to hear. And they're not interested in sparing our feelings or sparing our emotions. No, but they're going to call a duck a duck. They're going to call it what it is, right? The Word of God tells us when you turn in... Um, and we're going to we're going to jump back and forth. Um, but I believe that when this is over, you're going to get a better understanding on how you can rise from the ashes of your own life. 
So if you look in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, and when you get there, um, I want you to look at uh, verse uh, 14 and um, 14 to 16. Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 14 to 16. Look at what it says. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone falls short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Now, let's break this down in relation to what we are talking about today. Look at what it says. Pursue peace with all people. That's first of all. Think about this. It doesn't just say pursue peace with people who are peaceful. But no, pursue peace with everybody. Pursue peace with every single person that comes your way, every single person that comes into your life, pursue peace that we, the word of God tells us in Matthew, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall inherit the earth. It is important for us as people of God to always be peaceful or to at least try to pursue peace right? To try to pursue peace. In fact, one scripture says that we should study to mind our own business, right? So and don't get involved with other people's business, right? That's one of the things I had to learn many years because, you know, oftentimes you try to help everybody and you try even sometimes to fix everybody. But guess what? That's not your place. Because if you could fix everything, if you could correct everything, then that would make you God, right? But you're not God, you're human, right? And so oftentimes, one of the best things that we can do sometimes is say no. One of the best things we could do sometimes is give a rebuke. The word of God talks about rebuke sharply. You know, in my life, I would rather someone, I would rather someone uh, tell me the absolute truth than to um, just give me like stuff that they think I want to hear. I would rather that. Right. So he says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Keep in mind, he says, pursue peace with all people and holiness. Now, one of the things, let's keep your finger on here. We're going to flip back to John. In John, what we find is that Mary and Martha was surrounded with a bunch of people who saw their misery, who saw what they were going through, and these people, all they could do is mourn and weep with them. All they could do is agree with them, right? So many people are sitting back and they are looking for people that agree with them. They're looking for people that goes along with their program. Right. And and this what what you really don't understand is that this will keep you stuck. It'll keep you stuck. It'll keep you right in that place. Here it was. Martha said to Jesus. Right. Um, She said when Jesus said your brother will rise again, Martha said, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And so what happened It kept her stuck in her mindset that here it was, Jesus, who said, I am the resurrection, right, and the life, that she knew he said this, right? She put Jesus in this category that, yeah, I know you're the resurrection and the life, and and what is going to happen, I'm going to be made whole when I get to heaven. My brother is going to be made whole when he gets to heaven in the resurrection, in that great day. Right. And so what happens is that so many of us, we don't realize Paul told Timothy, there are many that have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Let me tell you something, people of God. Right. God understands that we have emotion. But guess what? God's power is greater than your emotion. God's power is greater than what you've gone through. God's power is greater than your experiences. God's power is greater than what you have experienced or what you have gone through. God's power is greater. So many of us, we think that my hurts and the stuff that I've gone through will always be my hurt. And and I'm going to get over this finally when I get into heaven. 
I'm going to get over this pain and I'm going to get over the loss of my loved ones and I'm going to get over my troubles when I see uh, Jesus face to face, right? When I see him, then I will weep no more. Yes, this is true. However, Christ says, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. And one of the things we have to do, people of God, if we're going to rise from the ashes, is that we got to break free of those things that have hurt us. We got to break free. What I mean by break free, I don't mean changing your position. Because most of us, what we consider break free is that if that relationship has broken our hearts, then we figure if I get a new relationship, then I broke free of that. No, 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 no. Because what happens is that the residualness of the pain that you felt in that relationship, you carry into the next right? The fact that they didn't give you any attention before and that they overlooked you before, now you demand attention now, not realizing that that is an effect of your pain. The fact that many of us are drawn to people who are maybe not at our level or not who we um, who God has for us. However, they speak to something that that other person wounded, that that other person has hurt, that that other person has broken or has deceived us in, in, in things, right? So what happens is that although we may not be satisfied with everything about them, there is one part of them that satisfies my longing, that satisfies my hurt. The word of God says in James, let no man say that when he is tempted, he is tempted by God because God cannot be tempted with evil. But it says every one of us is tempted when we are drawn and enticed of our own desires. So what is your desire? Your desire may be, well, Lord, I want this. And maybe you haven't verbally said it, but from your heart, you desire that. You crave that. You crave love. You crave intimacy. You crave um, a partnership. You crave equality. You crave um, uh, joy, satisfaction, or safety, right? And oftentimes that craving is because something was lost. Something was lost. Because I'll share this with you. Usually when a person, when a person has been hurt, right? When a person has been hurt, usually it's not about the whole picture. Like they can't see everything. They only see that one thing. And that one thing becomes their central or centralized theme. That one thing becomes their everything. But then, although they may get that one thing, guess what? There is a portion of them or a part of them that still says, this is not 100% of what I want. But for them, it becomes, well, I need this because this thing puts me in a better place. When Martha said to Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. That's not true because it is appointed under every man to die, right? So it's appointed on everyone. So a lot of people think, well, if God, if you was, if you was in this thing, I would not have gotten my heart broken. God, if you, if you wanted to, you could have stopped them from deceiving me. God, you could have stopped them from doing, but guess what? Just like Jesus did, sometimes God will lay back. Sometimes God will lay back because there is something that you need to understand about God. And I'm here to tell you tonight as a living witness that God is a healer of brokenness. He is a healer of brokenness. And guess what? It, all you have to do is really believe that he is able to do this. That's what he said to Martha. Look back in John. He says in verse 26, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. He says, do you believe this? Do you believe God is able to free you from the pain? Now, let's be careful because when we go back to Hebrews chapter 12, Look what it says, verse 15, looking carefully, lest anyone falls short of the grace of God. 
falling short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many has be, been defiled. Now, when you look at this verse in the New Living Translation, bitterness is described as jealousy. Because when you look at the definition of, of bitterness, when you look at that definition, the je definition of bitterness is jealousy, anger, and disappointment at being treated unfairly, resentment, right? To have resentment, to have that disappointment in your heart from being treated unfairly, right? And so all of us have had times in our lives where we felt like, you know what, somebody wasn't treating us well enough or somebody didn't treat us well enough or someone lied to us or someone disappointed us, right? And so we have to be careful that that feeling or that emotion of what we felt is now not applied to our hearts and then our hearts become bitter. The bitterness is the state of jealousy. It's the state of of resentment. It is the resolve, if you will, the feeling of insecurity, the feeling of fear. I'm worried that somebody else is going to cheat on me. So what do I do? I impressed upon this person to, to give me their time and to give me their attention, right? And it's because it's a covering, if you will, for the bitterness in your heart, the jealousy in your heart, the insecurity in your heart. And I know we don't like saying these tough words. These tough words of bitterness make it seem like we're weak, make it seem like, oh my God, I'm miserable. No, but you got to understand for each and every one of you, anything that you have gone through, anything that you have experienced has the power to bring bitterness in your heart. Any negative thing that you have experienced, any painful situation that you have experienced can bring bitterness in your heart. And it's not that you are sitting there saying, I'm mad with them and I'll, I'm, I'm not going to ever talk to them. No, that's, that's an extreme case. But in other cases, there are residualness of pain. There is residualness of feelings of disappointment and feelings of insecurity that happens in all of our lives that impacts us in such a way that it filters our, it filters our choices. It filters our choices, right? It, it, it impacts our choices, the choices that we make, the decisions that we make, the conversations that we have. It impacts my, my disposition on the things that I see and how things are reflected in my life. You know, the things that I see in my life and what has happened in my life and how I perceive those things right? Can, can be the eyeglass, if you will, by how you perceive life. You can perceive life. You can perceive, perceive somebody's conversation. You can perceive somebody's heart and somebody's feelings and emotion. And you start finding yourself spending more time trying to analyze what people say versus hearing what people say. Bitterness is so crafty. Jealousy is so crafty. Um, envy is so crafty. Insecurity is so crafty. All these things are masks that we cover. And in fact, even in leadership, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of pastors, a lot of leaders that are covering an inner pain, are covering an inner disappointment, are covering something in their lives that they have not surrendered to God. And so because of that, they hide it under a message. They hide it under a sermon. They hide it under leadership or under the way they talk to people. They hide it under those things. And then a lot of us have become so churchy until we are quick to use scripture and things like that to mask what we're really feeling. And where is it really coming from? Where is it really coming from, right? And, and, and this is important to know. And honestly, look, I could sit here all day and I could tell you this truth and you may not even understand the depths of it. Even to this day, 
I have to examine my motives. Do you understand me? I'm, I'm, I want to, my God, I want to break this down for you in such a way that maybe no one has explained to you. If you're going to rise from the ashes, this is not a one-time deal. And this is not, pastor, I did that last year or pastor, I did that. No, you're going to have to do it every single day of your life. You're going to have to be careful Less any root of bitterness, because let's be honest, your experience is your experience, right? What you've gone through and the things that you face is what it is. And, and just because you broke off with that relationship, just because you, this happened 20, 30 years ago, don't mean that something else is not going to come up 10 years later, right? 10 years from now that will affect that area or that wound that will affect something in you. And so each time you have to be careful, lest any bitterness starts coming up in that stuff. Right. And we have to be careful, especially those of us who, who say that we are, teachers and preachers of the gospel. We have to be careful because oftentimes we spend so much time talking to others. Even the word of God says that I myself can preach to others and I can be a castaway, right? Because it's so easy that when you are talking to others and when you present yourself as being a leader or you present yourself as being someone that for others to follow, right? It's so easy to get caught up in your leading that you forget that you also are a follower of Christ and that the Holy Spirit will point out things in your own heart. The Holy Spirit will reveal things even in you, um, not, not necessarily for a sermon or for another class, but the Holy Spirit will reveal things in you because he wants you to submit yourself. He wants you to humble yourself, to stay humble in his presence to stay, to stay clean in his presence. For he says, who shall ascend into the holy mount of God? Only those with pure hands and, I mean, uh, clean hands and a pure heart, right? So, so we ourselves have got to always, every single one of us, and tonight, and even this lesson that I'm teaching from the ashes, this is not for Pastor Rodney to teach to you, but this is for all of us to consider, Pastor Rodney included, consider the condition of our hearts and what is going on inside. Oftentimes I find even with people that I know um, who are men and women of God who have died before the Lord, I notice that God always give, has always given them the, the sermon of, of, of cleanliness before they died before they died. Like they would talk about, you know, maybe coming to people and like one of my dear friends, you know, he recently passed and, and, uh, a couple of weeks before he passed, he preached a sermon. And in this sermon, he was talking about, you know, that if I've done you any wrong, please forgive me. If I've done you anything, if I said anything that was disappointing, please forgive me. Why? Because the Holy Spirit wants to make us clean in his presence. We can't go to heaven with junk. We can't stand before a holy God with junk in our lives. We can't stand before a holy, perfect God justifying our actions and our reactions and justifying even our emotions concerning something. No, my friends, no matter what people have done to you, no matter what has happened in your life, you must forgive them. And this must be a daily thing. You must ask God to filter that junk out of your heart because in your humanity, you always feel it. Remember, even the apostle Paul said these words. He says, whatsoever things were accounted to me and everything that I've gone through, he said, I can consider it, but nothing, right? One scripture, he says, he says, if, if, if I, anyone have done me any wrong, I forgive you, right? This was at the end of his life. It is important that we've got to let go of that stuff because what does it says in Hebrews? It says, looking carefully, lest anyone falls short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up the greatness of who God would want you to be. The, the greatness of who God is trying to cause you to be, that greatness will be greatly diminished 
because of the bitterness inside, because of the jealousy inside, because of those feelings of fear and a lack of safety and not being able to trust people, right? So for those of you who find it difficult to trust people, for those of you that find it difficult to make friends, for those of you who find it difficult to let go of stuff and to stop talking about the negative. For those of you who, when when somebody makes you upset, you hold on to your anger for hours or days. Or For those of you that experience that, listen, don't justify it in your life. Do not justify it and though, well, well, pastor, this is just my way and I need time to process. No, you are angry. I'm going to tell you exactly why. Check this out. Jesus says, unless you receive the kingdom of God as a little child, you shall in no wise enter therein. Look at children. What does children do? Children could have an attitude with one another. And you can change the game and they'll start playing back together. If you leave kids alone, they will start playing back together with the very person that hurt them. If somebody hit them and they was crying and that other kid will feel bad. And sometimes if you look at that kid, if he hits another child and that child starts crying and when that child starts crying, what does the first child start doing? That child starts crying as well. Why? Because that child is not, and I ain't talking about no bad kids. I ain't talking about those kids that y'all done raised to be little minions. I ain't talking about those kids. I'm talking about natural children. Natural children undefiled by us parents and us adults. Um, Natural children don't want to hurt a fly. They don't want to hurt a worm. I I remember my, my daughter my daughter, I used to take her in the park and, and I would show her different things. And if she stepped on a worm, she stepped on a worm, she'd be in the car crying. What happened? Because I killed the worm, right? Because natural children don't want to hurt anybody, right? So when they hurt somebody, they are so quick to forgive. They're so quick to say, I'm your friend. They're so quick to hug. They're so quick to kiss. They're so quick to embrace. It's only when we become adults that we start holding things on each other. It's only when we start becoming wiser and more intelligent and more knowledgeable that we actually lose our childlike disposition. Right? And so look at what he says. You have to be careful. He says, lest, look at verse 16 in Hebrews chapter 12, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. In other words, Esau just wanted a plate of food, something for the moment he wanted to satisfy, then he sold his birthright. So many of us, maybe even some of you watching, you have sold the very gift that God has given you. Some of you have Listen, some of us have been hurt by other people, but some of us have also become the one who hurts and we've sold the best of what God has for us. We've sold the best of what God has for us. Why? Because we try to pigeonhole everyone to conform to our life, to conform to what we believe life should be. The fact is, whether it be a woman or a man who wants to rule the house so that the house will please them, that's based upon your hurts. That base, If you want the world to make you happy, it is because you're hurt. If you want everyone to give attention to you when you talk, it's because you're hurting inside. If you want everyone to pay attention to you and focus on you when you're talking, but then when they start talking, you start multitasking, you're hurt. You're hurting and you're looking for attention. Now, I'm going to prove this to you in scripture. In scripture, I'm going to prove this to you. Let's turn to the book of Acts. Acts chapter eight. And we're going to, we're going to continue this in part three. Um, God's willing tomorrow. 
right? But we're going to give you peace at a time because we want you to examine this. We want you to really take this to heart and really review it and look at it in your life. So I don't want to give you too much. We're going to break everything down piece by piece as the Lord gives it unto us, right? So look in Acts chapter eight, right? And I'm going to be bouncing around starting at verse nine. Look at what it says. It says, but there was a certain man named Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was somebody great. Right? I want, I want, to, I want you to look at that for a second. He was claiming that he was somebody great. Right? Now, when you, when you read this story, you're going to find out that he had a problem. And part of his claiming how great he was, was because of this problem. In today's time, we have this word that narcissistic. If, if a person is a narcissist, we, we look at that as being a person who is stuck on themselves, always have to be right, always have to be great. Um, always is always got, always got to have the last word, always got to prove a point, always got to get everyone to agree with them. Listen, if you are, if, if in your life, you are the type of person that when you talk to people, right, you're like this, like you're, you're always trying to get them to look in your face. And if they don't look in your face, you almost feel like they're not hearing you. Right now, I understand that there's a level of respect and there's a level of communication that requires attention. Right. But I understand that oftentimes for some of us, what we consider to be normal is really based upon bitterness is based upon the hurts of our soul. And remember, remember, I told you bitterness is the state. It is the the final state of your conclusion relative to your feelings. Right. So mind you, we all feel, we all experience, we all hurt, we all bleed, we all go through disappointments, we all go through situations of life that, that um, uh, causes us to feel some kind of way, we all go through that, male and female. However, bitterness is when you conclude that they did this to me. And I don't like it. That's bitterness. They did this to me and I don't like it. And I don't never want this to happen again. That's that's bitterness, right? Because it's based upon a level of trying to control what other people do. And so what happens is that oftentimes relationships, although relationships may have sex, and relationships may have, you might share a house, you may share a bed, you may share a dinner table, you may share a whole lot of things, but guess what? You're not even together. You're not even together. Because one is trying to make the other one do what I want, and the other one is either bowing to that, or the other one is fighting against that, or the other one is ignoring that. And this is often what we have in relationship because we don't understand just because that person agrees with you don't mean it's good for you. Sometimes what happens is what connects people is not the, the commonality that God would want them to have, but what connects people is that they speak to one another's hurt because that can connect you as well. They speak to one another's desires that can connect you as well. And that doesn't mean that you're a good fit. Doesn't mean you're a good fit. Just because, <laughs> just because uh, I'm lustful and you lustful don't mean that we're direct fit. Because that speaks to one side of us. And a lot of us, we say, you are, you're right, pastor. I don't want one side of anybody. You know, I want somebody that we are totally compatible. But wait, compatibility doesn't mean that we always agree. Because in the, in the, in the true sense of the word, a key is compatible to only certain locks, not to every lock. 
right? So just because you're a lock and he's a key don't mean that you're compatible because it may not be the lock that you was designed for. That key may not be the key that was designed for that lock. Yeah, they might be a key, but it may not be your key. You know, sometimes when I come into my house, sometimes I'm coming up the stairs and the hallway may be kind of dark, right? And I grab my keys and sometimes I have the key in my, the key that I know I need for my lock. And sometimes because I have bags in my hand, I may drop the keys on the floor. And so I reach down to grab the key. Now it's dark and I stick the key in the lock that I think is the right key. And guess what? I turn it. Guess what? It's a key. Guess what? It's my key. Guess what? It's my lock. Guess what? It's my apartment. But guess what? That key don't fit. And so many of us, the difficulties that we're experiencing in life now and the difficulty that we're going through in our present relationship is because we took a key and we connected to a lock and we keep trying to force that lock to open and it's not opening. Don't you know that God's will for your life is that you might be the head and not the tail. God's will is not for your life to be where you're struggling in relationship. And for some things, you got to loose that thing and let it go. Some things you got to let that thing go because that thing is not functioning for you and you're not functioning for that thing because let's look at it on both sides of the fence. Don't just look at it because oftentimes the messages that we hear today is a very selfish message. It's about how you're great. You're great and everything must bow to you and everything must, must submit to you and everything must be perfect for you. And God is here to give you what you want. And God is here to answer your prayers. And God is here to, to do the blessed thing for you. And God knows the plans he has for you and thoughts of peace and not of evil. But what is the stuff that God wants you to do for him? Okay. That relationship Is Mind you, (laughs) let me go even deeper. Keep in mind, if you're considering marriage, for those of you who are not married, if you're considering marriage, guess what? Marriage is supposed to reflect a heavenly principle. So in other words, what is it that God wants you to reflect? Not is it that what you want to reflect, what kind of marriage you want, what kind of life you want. You know, right now I'm dealing with people. I know people who got married to somebody who they considered to be the love of their life. And guess what? When that husband died, now they're shattered. Or maybe that wife died or maybe that person. You know, I just was talking to somebody the other day who lost their um, pastor three weeks ago, almost four weeks ago, lost their pastor. And then right behind that, three weeks later, lost their pastor's wife. I'm here to tell you, people of God, see, listen, you got to understand that God says you were bought with a price. Therefore, you must glorify God in your body. You got to understand that once you glorify God in your body, now you can actually see. In fact, that's what the word of God talks about when it talks about that. um, How can you cast the splinter that's in your brother's eye out when you got a beam in your own eye? It says first, Take out the beam out of your eye and it says, then maybe, not not definitely, but maybe you will be able to see how to cast the splint out of your brother's eye, right? It doesn't mean because sometimes because you had that beam in your eye for so long, sometimes your own vision is obscured. And so sometimes it may be none of your business to cast the splint out of that brother's eye. Like Jesus said to uh, Peter, when he said, Peter, if you love me, feed my lamb, feed my sheep, feed my lamb. Right. And then Peter looked at John and he said, well, what about him? And Jesus said, what is that to you? That don't nothing to do with you. It don't nothing to do with you. He says, if I want him to stay here forever, then he stay here. That don't have nothing to do with you. Mind your business. And for some things I'm here to tell you, God will tell you, mind your business. For some things, just because you have a good marriage don't mean you need to um, do a class on marriages. You know, just because just because uh, um, you you are a phenomenal woman don't mean mean you need to do a whole uh, sermon on phenomenal women, because guess what? There may be some pride in you. There may be some lust in you. That when you start to teach some of that same junk that's within you is going to come out 
It's going to come out in the way you do what you do. It's going to come out in how you act in your, in your sermons. It's going to come out in everything. You got to understand that what you have inside, guess what? Everything the tree has inside the tree is put into the fruit. So if that tree got worms, guess what? That fruit is going to have worms. So, so it's important to know that we have to first clean the vessel. Jesus even said, no one takes new wine and puts it in old wineskins. It's not going to happen. You got to clean out the junk that's inside. You got to clean out the envy and the jealousy and the insecurity. You got to clean it. Too many of us are saying, God, give me my spouse. God, give me my stuff. And you still got junk inside. You still got a temper. How are you going to be with somebody who God has chosen for you, who is different than you, who don't agree with your program, who don't always go along with the, with the agenda of your life and how you act and how you behave, and you have not released that bitterness and that anger and take it to the Lord every single day of your life and say, God, rid me of this stuff so I'm not as sensitive. So I'm not as going through the feelings of my emotion when, when the person disappoints me, now I disrupt the whole house. Now I disrupt the whole day. And for some of us, we have gotten so comfortable with our disruption until we expect everyone who comes into our life to just get used to it. Come on now, people of God. You want everybody to get used to it because you got comfortable with it. You want everybody to get used to your behavior because you got comfortable with it. I remember when, um, <laughs> and I had to really thank God for my, um, when, when I was married and, and I went through divorce, right? But when I was married um, many, many years ago and went through divorce long, long time ago and, and half of the stuff that I'm sharing with you now, I did not have any clue about. I didn't, I was just like any other person just taking life by the horns, uh, looking for someone to, to please me, just very, you know, not, I didn't know it at that time, but guess what? Very arrogant, very arrogant, um, looking for someone that I could trust. Why? Why are you looking for someone you can trust? Why are you looking for that? You're looking for that because of the fact that, that deep down inside, you met somebody who was untrustworthy. See, because keep in mind, when we first, without any wounds, when we first fall in love, we fall in love in innocence. We fall in love believing. We fall in love trusting. It's only after we've been hurt that we now want to measure if I can trust this person before I fall in love with them. You know, let's look back at, at Acts chapter eight, because we started out talking about Simon, right? Look at what happened. Simon was claiming to be that he was somebody great, verse 9, right? But then I want you to look at, let's look at verse 11. Verse 11, and they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. There's a lot of people that are astonishing people. There's a lot of people that are causing people to think that they are so powerful that you are astonishing people with your knowledge. You are astonishing people with your gift, with your prosperity, with your uh, discernment. You are astonishing people with your visions. You are astonishing people with all that. But all that stuff is masking something inside. Let's keep reading. Verse 13. Then Simon himself also believed and he was baptized, and he continued with Philip. Look what it says. And was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Right? One of the keys that people are wounded inside is when they are caught up right away with the signs and miracles that other people do. Right? Because what it does, it draws you, your hurt always draws you to a better place. Hurts and wounds always judge you to a better place. So, you know, sometimes, you know, it doesn't bother me 
But sometimes I'll see like people who, let's say a woman who was hurt or a woman who was um, um, uh, misused or abused by another man. And then they come on my videos or they watch a video of mine or something like that. And they'll go, wow, wow, I feel you, brother. Man, I want a man just like you. How do you know? How do you know? How do you know you want a man just like me or just like somebody else or just like that person? Because of what you saw in that one thing? Because you saw what you saw in that thing? That thing is speaking to your hurt. And so because that man comes in a manner that is smooth or that woman for that fellas, fellas, if that woman comes into your life and it's something in her that is just, wow, it just speaks to something in me and it says, wow, I want that in my life. It's coming from a place of bitterness. It's coming from a place of wound because you don't know all of them. And honestly, come on, when they don't take your call, you get an attitude. When they don't answer your call, you get an attitude. Why? Because you don't want them. You want what they was offering in that one shot. That's bitterness. Look at what happened. Simon, the sorcerer, he saw these miracles and signs and he was like, wow. Now I want you to look at verse 18 to 23. Check this out. Look at, what, look, look at what the word of God says. Very powerful. It says, and when Simon saw, verse 18 to 23 in, in Acts chapter 8, when Simon saw that through the laying, hand, laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Verse 19, saying, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit, right? There's so many of us that because we are hurt, we need something to show us that we are valuable, right? Now, mind you, before this instance, keep in mind, the word of God says, people already said, you're great. <laughs> people already said, you're wonderful. You, you have power. But he saw something that somebody else had that he didn't have, he saw someone else have a power that he didn't exert, and guess what? Now he's feeling bad about his own power, right? He said for a long time, wait, wait, let's go back, let's go back, let's go back, right? Verse nine and verse 11, look at what it says. But there was a certain man named Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria claiming that he was someone great. Look at verse 11. And they heeded him because they gave heed to him. They listened to him. Why? Because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. And there's so many of us that you have been doing so many good things for a long time, but then when somebody else come, like even like sometime I had one one time where I was preaching at a church, right? And and when I was preaching at a church, and guess what? This church is a mega ministry, right? This church is bigger than my church. They got much more than my church e ever have, right? They got more property. And while I was there, I was like, man, I would love to have this. Man, I could do so much with this. I could do so much with that, right? Also like that, right? And and I was looking at this stuff and I was like, wow, this is beautiful, right? And 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 so like that. And, and so I preached a sermon. When I preached a sermon, uh, when I finished preaching the sermon, the pastor said to me in front of a couple of people, the pastor said, you can't come here no more. And, I, and, and a couple of people said, why not? Right. He said, because, man, after what you did, if you come here, I'm going to be out of a job. Because the people are going to want you more than they want me. Guess what? For a long time, you've been serving them. For a long time, you've been giving them the best, hopefully the best that you are. Right. For a long time, you've been parenting. For a long time, you've been a wife or a husband. For a long time, you've been hopefully giving your best. For a long time, you've been giving your best. 
right? So if you've been giving your best and then somebody comes in who can do something a little more than you, then why do you now want what they have? Right? Let's finish what he says. He says, verse 19, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Look at what Peter said. Verses 20 to 23, he says, but Peter said to him, your money perish with you because firstly, you thought that the gift of God can be purchased with money. So number one, for those of you that are following after somebody so that you could be like them, number one, you thought that you could have what they have because you're following them. You thought that you could get what they got because you heard a message. You thought that you could um, obtain where they are because you took copious notes. No, you know, that's why you have folks, Christians, who go and they follow worldly people. Why? Because that person speaks to a lack in your life. That, that person speaks to an emptiness in your life, so you pursue them. This is why so many saints went out there and bought Steve Harvey's book. How to be a woman and think like a man. Why would you want to think like a man, ladies? Please tell me. Please tell me the sense of that. I understand the concept. The concept is that it'll help you to make better choices and better decisions because you understand how men think and it'll cause you not to be deceived by men. That's the, that's the concept. But tell me, where does God tell you to think like a man? Please tell me. In fact, that's the problem today. You don't know who's a man and who's a woman. Because we're all trying to think like one another. And so God didn't make us to think like each other. No, he made you who you are. And you must think as you are. Otherwise, it's a defilement. Right. This is why so many have pursued uh, Michelle Obama or, or other people. Oprah Winfrey, they, they joined the Oprah Winfrey book club and they read all the books. And this is why they go to her, her classes. I forgot the name of her show that she has some class, something with master class or something like that, that she has. You know, if you want the master class, why don't you follow the master? Follow the master. And you'll get the master class. So many other people that go to Ted and they watch Ted or they go to Dr. Phil and they watch Dr. Phil or Dr. Oz because you're pursuing something and, and you're doing like Job said. Job says, he says, that which I feared the most has come upon me. You're running from something. You're, this is why you can have a woman or a man that matter who is educated and knowledgeable, but you choose the wrong people in relationships. Because they speak to a pain inside that you're not allowing God to deal with and to give you an understanding with. Okay? You're not allowing God to give you an understanding because once you have an understanding, then it's no longer a pain. The doctor, and they told me that my, my leg or my arm is out of joint. In order to put it in joint and to make me walk properly, they got to break the leg. Then I no longer cry about that. That doctor broke my leg. Because I understand that it was the path that I had to take in order to be well. And so if I understand that, that, that because of sin in the world and because of certain things that's in the world, then guess what? The Holy Spirit can give me an understanding to what I'm going through, right? The Holy Spirit can give me an understanding to the things that I went through and why I went through it and what was his purpose in going through it. So then now I can no longer, I don't have to look at those things from a heart of emotionalism and pain, but now I can understand it that God, that had to happen or God, that didn't have to happen, but I sinned against you. I turned from you. I walked away from you. I didn't do what you told me to do. And that's why that happened. So guess what? No longer do I blame that person. No longer do I blame the situation, but I now understand it. I now understand that this is what has happened in my life because of where I was. I now understand it, that this is what happened in my life because of where that person was. 
And that if I was in a better place, if I was in a better place with God, God could have shown me differently. Or in some things, God has led me to the wilderness to be tempted of the enemy so that I might demonstrate something greater. So either way, there's no more complaints about it. And it doesn't filter my life, but it gives me a better understanding. This is why even in my divorce, when I went through divorce, in my particular life, because I allowed for God to take me through an understanding of that stuff, not just a head understanding, but a heart understanding of who I am as a man and what I have done as a man and what I have gone through as a man and what choices that I've made because I understand it. This is why post my divorce, my divorce, that I've helped more couples than when I was married. It doesn't make that because you went through divorce, you can now talk to people. No, no, no. You need an understanding. The word of God says in all of your getting, get an understanding. You got to have an understanding because if you don't have an understanding, then guess what? Everything that you've gone through, you're just apt to repeat it or just to be stuck right there in that understanding. You know, that you, you're stuck in, in, in your mindset or stuck in your ideologies or stuck in your thought process, you know, because when you're stuck in your thought process, it's like, you know, now you find yourself in that situation that although you should know better, you don't know better, Right. Or when you talk to people, you don't talk to them in a way that gives them an understanding. Why? Because you yourself don't have an understanding. All you can talk about is the emotionalism of it. Because that's the only thing you know. You know how you feel about it. Right? So a lot of times when I see people's postings, the Holy Spirit administered to me, that person is bitter. That person is going through. That person is wounded. That person hasn't forgiven someone. That person is still holding on to the past. That person is afraid. That person is bound by fear. That person is bound by lust. And the Holy Spirit will minister it to you. Look at what happened. Peter said, your money perished with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. He says, you have neither part nor portion or lot in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. See, oftentimes the word, the word of God says that every man's deeds is right in his own eyes. And for me, you know, oftentimes, and I'm talking about daily, I have to ask the Lord literally, not as a tagline or as a conclusive line to a prayer or the beginning introductory prayer, but no, as, as seriously asking God to search my heart. I have to do it daily because daily the memories of certain experiences tries to creep back up daily. And sometimes it'll skip sometime and I'll go, I'll coast along and everything is good and everything is golden. And then something will happen and it'll dredge up something of an experience that my flesh is saying, yeah, I remember that my brain was like, yep, I remember that happened. That ain't happening to me no more. And sometimes you have to be careful, ladies and gentlemen, you have to be careful when people come to you and they ask a question that a lot of times those of us who are supposed to be spiritual, we're talking them to them from emotion. You're talking to them from emotion. You're talking to them about the way you feel and not with thus says the Lord. You're coming to them with this mindset that is based upon a wound that you experienced based upon a, a, a trouble, a trial that you've gone through, based upon the fact that you never had a relationship with your father or your mother and you don't want to even know them now. Got to be careful. That's what Hebrew said, be careful. You got to be careful. You got to loose them and let them go because you don't wrap them with grave clothes. 
You done buried them in the tomb. And now you just mourning for days over them. They've been dead. Lazarus was dead for some time. He was dead for a couple of days and they were still mourning and making a whole lot of noise. When Jesus said, I am the resurrection life, they still were making noise. And this is the problem. Many of us, we, we want to say, like, like I told you, the apostle Paul said to, to Timothy, there are many that have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. That power of God to do in you what you can't do. That power of God to do the supernatural, which means it's beyond what is capable in humanity. Beyond what is capable in your human ability. Right? So it doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not something you can intellectualize. But it's something that just is. God stepped out into darkness and said, let there be light. So in our intellect, we say, okay, I step into a room and I cut on a light switch. There was power. No, there wasn't no power there other than the word of God. Right? Just like science says, you know, that, that yeah, God may have started it, but, you know, it's these, these, these uh, minerals that came together and these amoebas that came together and this plankton that came together and then fish came together and then fish came out of the water and walked on land and then they walked on land and then they started growing legs. Yeah, you could try to intellectualize it, but guess what? When it comes to the power of God, he don't need your intellect. God don't need your understanding. God don't need your resolving it in your mind. No, there is power that is available for you to purge your heart, to cleanse your heart. And then every time that thing comes back up, you need to filter it against the word of God. You need to filter it against the word of God. Stop making excuses for it. Filter it against the word of God. Rebuke it, deny it, kill it mortified the deeds of your flesh. You got a purpose in your mind that God, I need the Holy Spirit to give me the power to kill the deeds of my flesh. My flesh wants to keep me in bondage. My flesh wants to keep me having that same centralized theme of stuff that I've gone through. My flesh wants to feel some kind of way about what I've gone through. You know, I said to someone, <clears throat> In fact, I said it to several people who have gone through this before. And I want you to listen to me tonight, right? For those of you who didn't have father or mother, or maybe you've gone through hard times and hard times in your life, difficult times in your life, right? Um, if you didn't have a father in your life, let, let's use father, for example. If you didn't have a father in your life, but today you are occupationally successful, you are financially successful. Yeah, you have struggles, but you're financially successful. You're not poor. You're not on the street. You have your own place, apartment, house, condo, co-op, whatever, right? Also, you're saved. You're born again, right? Then think about this. Plus a plethora of other, other benefits that you have. Think about this. Would you have been better if you had a father? Or would you have been worse? And in fact, me and one of my friends was talking about this the other day, and she even mentioned this as well. She mentioned that the question is, would I have been better having a father or worse? <clears throat> you don't know. Because maybe some of the negative traits of your father would have been impregnated into you. Maybe some of the negative traits or the worldly traits of your mother would have been impregnant to you and you would have been worse. You don't know. See, we can assume that the grass is always greener, but as Maya Angelou say that, guess what? Sometimes we don't realize that the water bill is higher too. Some of the things that God didn't allow to happen in our lives is because it was his purpose and plan not to allow those things to happen so that we can come to the path that we ought to take. Like I shared with you, the word of God says a man plans his way, but the Lord orders his steps. 
God orders our steps and he shows the way that we ought to take so that we can get to the place that glorifies him, that magnifies him, that his will and his plans and his purposes can be performed in our lives. And when we come to that understanding that everything works together for my good, then guess what? I'm no longer in the ashes of that stuff, right? Let's wrap this up. We're going to get ready to wrap this up in a few minutes. He says, repent therefore, verse 22, of this your wickedness and pray if perhaps God, if, if God, if perhaps, pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you, right? So he's saying that you need to pray that God would forgive you for you thinking that you can buy this for you thinking that you could get this by just following, that you could get this for just being a part of this. Look at what he says in verse 23. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness or jealousy. If you look in the New Living Translation, <clears throat> that word bitterness means jealousy. Bitterness and bound by iniquity, by sin. Right? Now, what does that mean? You are poisoned by the bitterness. The bitterness has defiled you, Simon. All the great things that you were doing, and so many of us, even God himself says, many are going to say in that day, Lord, Lord, but he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Because we were doing great things, but our hearts were not right. We were doing great things, and people applauded us, and people were astonished by us. But deep down inside, we were broken. Deep down inside, wounded. That's why we're so sensitive. That's why we fall apart so quickly. That's why we go through. And mind you, this is not Pastor Rodney coming at you to, to beat you over the head. Because I'm saying to you that I have to do that daily in my life. God Rid my heart of everything that I've gone through, every disposition that I've had, every mindset that I've had to, to feel like I've been, there's been injustice in my life or there has been um, pains in my life, right? Look at, look at Stephen. Stephen, when he was being stoned, Stephen, he cries, and that's in uh, Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 and uh, verse 59 and 60. It says, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, re receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Now, mind you, they're stoning him. And Stephen bows down. That's what you have to do, my friends. If you're going to rise from the ashes, you got to bow down and humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, knowing that he is God. That's what the word of God said in Hebrews. Those who come to God must first believe that he is God. God is God. He know every path you took. He know every choice you made. Some of the things that you've gone through didn't happen because of what you did that day. But there was a domino effect that happened years ahead of time. Sometime it may have been something that has been happened to you. Whether it be abuse or molestation or something like that. And those things have impacted you in such a way that here it is now. You are, you have a disposition. You have a mindset. That, that kind of rules your life. You can't, you can't receive, you can't readily receive true love because you don't know, you haven't been able to identify love because in your formative years, your innocence were taken. And so because of that, th that, that bitterness, that disposition filters everything in your life. And if you really look over your life, you'll find that your bitterness have caused you to also hurt some people along the way. 
And that's what I had to see, that the things that I went through in childhood had affected some of my choices and my decisions where although I was hurt by what they did to me, guess what? Along the way, I'd done some hurt myself. And that's what he told Simon. He, he told Simon, he says, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness. You're poisoned by your disposition concerning what you went through. But then you are bound to that bitterness by the iniquity that you cause. You are bound by that stuff. And this is why people come to the place where they want everybody just to get used to it. Just take me as I am. Right? Anybody who love me better love me the way I am. Because if you can't love me the way I am, then you ain't worthy of me. Are you kidding me? No, there's certain things you have to change. There's certain junk. There's certain junks in your life that you got to let go. You got to you got to cut those things off. You got to kill your flesh just like I got to kill my flesh. You got to kill your disposition just like I got to kill my disposition in order to allow for the life of Christ to be manifest in my life and in your life. And, and this is something that has to go on for a, in a daily basis, a daily basis for the rest of your life. Otherwise, those things creep up and it becomes a part of what we talk about when we talk about familiar spirits. Those familiar spirits will attach themselves to the things that you have become comfortable with. And then now no one can tell you you're wrong. And it takes a lot for you. If you are the type of person that it takes a lot for you to see that you're wrong, you may be bound by bitterness. If it takes a lot for you to say, I'm sorry, without making an excuse, then you're bound by, by iniquity. If you have to control the conversation, you're bound. If you got to, if everybody got to curtail to your ways, you're bound. But here's the good news. There is freedom in Christ. And when we acknowledge our sin, God will hear us. When we acknowledge that this is not perfectly how Christ would want me to act, then God will hear us. When, when we acknowledge that this is my flaws, come on, you can't spend the rest of your days blaming other people for the stuff that you have in your life. Because you could blame people for the things they've done, but you can't blame people for your responses. You got to blame you. You got to blame you. That was your choice to be angry. That was your choice. To walk away. That was your choice. Don't blame them. Well, because they cheat on me, I had to um, divorce them. The devil is a liar. No, you didn't have to. Because even God said, Jesus himself said. He says, he says that any cause for divorce, except for the cause of fornication, you're held guilty for. But then when you look at the whole word of God, the scripture says, I believe it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that if an unbeliever wants to stay, let them stay. So in other words, if the person desires to turn from their mess, right, and you guys work it out, then guess what? Your marriage can be restored. Don't you listen to that lie that said, oh, because they cheated on me, I got to leave. Or because... Things are not working out. I got to leave. No, you need to take your behind home and work it out. Now, if it can't be worked out. But make no mistake about it. Understand that every relationship required two people to make it work and two people to make it break. So if, if, if it broke, not because of what they did, because of what you did too. Right now, yeah, what they did, they're going to give an account for. But equally so, what we did, we're going to give an account for. We're going to give an account for every choice we make. And for some of us, this is why 
the season of God giving you what you desire is because you're not ready for that level. Thank you, Dorothea. Thank you. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse 14, right? So, and that's the scripture that says, I believe that says, um, if the believer, the unbeliever wants to stay, let them stay. Let me, let me make sure before I tell you that for sure. Yeah. Um, well, well, let's look at, let me, let me look at really, let's look at verse 10 from verse 10 down to verse 16. Look at what it says. Now to the married, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now to the married, I command, yet not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say. Now, keep in mind, so many of us have tried to manipulate God's word in our minds. Oh, well, Paul is saying the Lord is not saying this, but it's me. Guess what? Either all of the Bible is God's word or none of it. Okay, I'll leave it like that. He says, but to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. So this is key. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. Now, what does that mean? That means that if, God forbid, there was somebody in your life who had an affair and they confessed that affair, whether, you know, whether they got caught or whatever it is to be, they confessed it and they said, you know what? You're absolutely right. That was wrong. I was wrong. I should not have done it. I want to build our marriage and you come together as a couple and they change. What do I mean by change? Let me talk about this for a second because I have a feeling this, the Lord is sharing with me that I believe that this is something that many of you have gone through. So let's, let's talk about from the man's position. So let's say if the husband has an affair, if the husband has an affair and he either gets caught or he either confesses, or you either confront him and he confesses, right? But then let's say if he decide, you know what, you're right. Say like he's with that woman, that, that other woman, and he severs connection with that other woman and devotes himself to you and says, no, I was wrong, I'm sorry, forgive me. And he comes into fellowship with you. That's what the word of God says when it talks about if he is willing to live with you. It's not talking about in body form. It's talking about in totality. Now, let me give you an understanding of the Lord. What has happened in so many of our lives, the reason why divorce had to become the reality is because although that person, let's say the husband, asked for forgiveness, repented, and turned away, ladies, and if the case was the wife cheated, men, what you guys have done is you made their existence hard. You made their existence hard and you used the fault and failure and the pain that you felt as a reason and excuse for your behavior. Before your lack of talking, for your lack of debating over certain things, going back, having a different opinion. And you made it so that they had to live if they was going to live with you, people also, let me see, Keanu said, people also have the mindset that once a cheater, always a cheater. Yeah, but see, that's because, Kiana, you know, the fact that if we were to say that, if we were to say once a cheater, always a cheater, keep in mind 
the word of God tells us that in the way you judge another, you shall be judged. So if I hold over somebody's head that because they cheated, they're going to always cheat on me, then guess what? Then God holds up my head, my sins and my faults, right? Now, in some cases, a cheater will be a cheater if they haven't repented of their cheating. Okay, you understand that? So that means, and we could go into so much, and, and maybe I need to touch on this tomorrow. We really need to talk because this is too, too broad and too deep, right? Think about this. The question is, Jesus found two women that we see in scripture that was caught in adultery. One woman was caught and Jesus told the men, if you have no sin, go ahead and stone her. Right? Because she was caught in adultery and the word says she should be stoned. So stone her. But you got to make sure you have no sin. Okay? The second woman Jesus didn't talk about a stone. He just told her, go get your husband, the woman at the well. And she said, I have no husband. He said, you're right. You've had five husbands and the woman you have now is not your husband. Right? And she runs back telling the men, come and see a man that have told me everything about me. Come and see this man, this incredible man. Right? What am I saying? We look at the act, but we don't look at why the act happened. So many of us, because we were not able to see clearly, we were not able to see the wounds that are in that person or the lust in that, in that person or the craving that's in that person. So marriage does not cure unrighteous longing. In other words, if you are lustful as a man or lustful as a woman, Having a good relationship is not going to fix you because your lust is not bounded by the ring and it's not bounded by um, marriage. It's not bounded by a contract or marriage license, right? And your lust won't be satisfied even if you, God gives you his best. God could give you his best and your lust won't be satisfied because lust is not about devotion. Lust is about satisfaction. Lust doesn't have devotion. Lust is not connected to anything but its own desire. So if your spouse is a person that has been bound by lust or ladies, if you are a lustful person, God ain't going to give you his best because you will ruin his best. It's the truth. And so many of us because we haven't, because we haven't resolved in our hearts the faults and failures of our own lives, and we haven't allowed God to show us those situations from his perspective, to show us those situations from his mind, from his heart, because we haven't allowed him to reveal to us who we are in truth in spirit and in truth, right? Because we haven't done that, right? Then what happens is that we have yet to see ourselves from the truest set of eyes. We have yet to see ourselves from the accuracy of who God is. And so we are like Lazarus. We are wrapped up with grave clothes. Grave clothes represents the past. It represents the old. It represents the dying or the dead. 
We are wrapped up in that. And we can't move as we would need to move. We can't perform like we would need to perform. We can't experience like we would need to experience. Why? Because we're bound in, we're bound by that. So when you have, and I'm just going to summarize this and we'll pick this up again, God's willing tomorrow. When you have a person who were lustful, then they get married for a temporary time. Their lust is satisfied, but then their lust starts to long for more. And because they were controlled by lust, they have an affair. Now, the breaking of the affair and the lustful ways is the destruction of lust. Not the changing of the guard or the changing of the person. Because, yeah, they leave that one person, but because they're lustful, then, Kiana, that's when you come to the place where once a cheater, always a cheater. Why? Because they may have left that one person, but because they're lustful, their lust eventually comes back. So the, the truest deliverance is when you get to the source of why they did what they did. The woman that Jesus told the men, if you are without sin, stone her, Jesus tells that woman, go and sin no more. So she needed to be rebuked. She needed to be corrected, right? But the woman at the well, Jesus said, go and get your husband. What's going on, Apostle Rodney? What's going on, bro? Um, Go and get your husband. And so the, the source of their lust was dealt with. And that's what our Lord deals with. He deals with the source, whereas us, we deal with the act. Well, stop doing that. Stop doing this. Don't do that no more. And then we take that person through years of where you made their life uncomfortable in the house. Or you made their lives about pleasing you and you alone. And guess what? That has put everybody else in bondage. And so it's time for you to loose them. It's time for you to loose everyone that has harmed you. Everyone that have disappointed you. Everyone that have said something about you or did something in your life. It's time for you to surrender that to God. And and there are things that we cannot do in our own because it's impossible. Certain things that we experience, it's impossible for us in our humanity to let those things go. But guess what? If we confess that thing to the Lord, if we confess it to the Lord, then guess what? God will open that part of your heart and he'll heal that part of your heart. And in the healing process, he'll give you a complete understanding. And every time that feeling or emotion comes up again, you have to combat it with the knowledge of what you know. You have to combat it with the understanding that God has given you. You can't just let it take its course and let it take over you and consume you and surmount you. No, you have to fight the good fight of faith. Every time it comes up, that's why the word of God says, when the enemy comes up against us like a flood, the Lord will lift up a standard against him. But you got to also fight the fight of faith. That's why God gave you the shield of faith to quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. And so stay tuned for part three tomorrow. I think I'm in right there. But it's important. It is important for you to loose them, to loose yourself, to to ask God. And so tonight when we go down in prayer, I want you to take the first step to saying this, God, 
forgive me. Forgive me for everything that I held over anyone's head. For the word of God says, forgive others their trespasses. Like, could we say, Lord, forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me. It's not just about saying it. But if you forgive them, then that's no longer an issue. But just take that first step to saying, God, forgive me. Because who am I that I can't go through something? Who am I that I can't suffer? Who am I that I can't, I can't be hurt? Am I, am I supposed to be untouchable? Nobody can hurt me. Nobody can say something to me that's disappointing. Nobody can harm me in any type of way. When my Lord and Savior suffered, bled, and died for me, which means that there is some part of my life that I'm going to have to suffer for something greater than me. Something greater than my comfort. So come on, can you take that first step and just say, God, forgive me for hanging over anyone's heads the things that they have done to me. Forgive me, God, for holding anger. Forgive me for holding unforgiveness, bitterness, jealousy, envy, insecurity, sorrow, fear, worry, anxiety. Forgive me, God, for not taking everything that I had to you so that in that moment you would heal me. So let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for this time that we've had together tonight, Lord God. And I thank you for every single person who thought it not robbery to join with me tonight, God. And I pray, God, in Jesus' name, as you know each of us, you told us that you know our uprising and our downsitting. You are acquainted with all of our ways. There is nothing that is hidden from you. So God, I pray in Jesus' name, everything that we've gone through from childhood, from our birthing experience, from our formative years, God, in our adolescence, in our developmental years, God, in our preteen years, in our teenage years, in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever it is, God, in our entire life, everything that we've gone through, God, it is your desire that we bring it all to you. For you said, casting all of our cares upon you, for you care for us. And God, you don't just care for us, but it is your desire that we be made whole. So God, I pray that tonight, as you are in to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, so many of your people, Father, in leadership and in non-leadership positions, so many of us are wounded. We're hurting. And this is why we're so sensitive. This is why we're so easy to be offended. This is why we're so easy to be hurt, Lord God. And Father, it is not your will that we be so sensitive because you told us in this life we're going to have trouble. And the enemy of souls will do anything to stop us, including allowing for words to be taken out of context or words to be said or people to do things to harm us, Lord God. But we must be resilient for you told us looking unto Jesus who is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and now has sat down at the right hand of the Father. You told us to consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest we faint and be weary in our minds. So help us, God, to stop thinking about ourselves to stop thinking of our own pain and our own existence, but to realize, Lord God, that you said all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and who are the called according to his purposes. Grant us this beginning step, Lord God, that we might begin in a place of healthy, a place of healthiness, Lord God, and, and a place of um, being, Lord God, strengthened, and a place of being made whole and healing and deliverance, Lord God. 
Help us in this first step, Lord God, that we would move to a refreshing time, that we would sense and discern and receive the power of your anointing to destroy every yoke and God to set every captive free. For God, you told you would be a light in the darkness. So God, help us, heal us, deliver us, and set us free so that we might loose everyone that we have wrapped grave clothes in and we have sealed them away in a tomb and we spend our days and our weeks and our months and our years crying over the same things. Forgive us, Lord God, and give us the strength to loose them and to let them go. God, we thank you and we bless your holy and wonderful name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. God bless you. Thank you for joining with me. Thank you for your time, your patience. Thank you. I do not stand in judgment of any one of you, but my desire is just to share with you what God has given unto me, that you and we and I may all be fulfilled and strengthened with might by the power of the Holy Spirit. Have a blessed and marvelous evening in Jesus' name. If this video has been good for you and encouraging to you, please share it with someone else that they will be able to be encouraged as well. God bless you. I love you all in Jesus' name. God bless each and every one of you that's been listening to the podcast and have been sending notes that the podcast has been a blessing to you. Keep me in your prayers. It is my desire to give you everything that God has given me. Um, I thank you for those of you who are supporters of this ministry. You guys are such a blessing to me. Thank you so much for those. I don't care if it's $5, $10. Thank you. I don't, I don't ask for it, but if you guys have blessed me with it, I appreciate it. It helps me in my life and the things that I'm doing for the kingdom of God. And so God bless you all. Thank you for your love. But the words of encouragement are such a blessing to me when you guys send messages and comments on the field talking about that this is good for you. Um, it's, it's such an encouragement to say, Lord, let me keep doing it because it requires work. It requires work. It requires study. It requires devotion. And because I'm devoting myself to these things, that I'm not out and about doing all the other stuff that maybe other people might be doing. You don't know. No, I'm in the house, on, in the Word, and at the computer, <laughs> probably like, <laughs> probably like more than 16 hours in a day, you know, just really studying and asking God for wisdom and knowledge and understanding and preparing better and trying to give you a better visual experience and a better audio experience and everything. And it costs money, right? And so I thank God for each of you. And the encouragement to me is more valuable than anything else because, you know, sometimes even myself as a pastor, you know, I, I can get discouraged, right? And I can be overwhelmed and sometimes I need rest. And so I thank you for those of you who have been a blessing to me. God bless you for all the work you do. May God reward you a hundredfold. God bless you. Have a blessed evening in Jesus' name. I love you. God bless.